That was the big thing for me to do, so. <laughs> Hello and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I am Maggie Wilderotter. I am the chairman and CEO of the Grand Reserve Inn, which is a boutique luxury resort in the Amador County here in California. I am the former chairman and CEO of Frontier Communications, and I'm an active board member. I have the privilege to sit on several boards, including Costco, Juno Therapeutics, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Chobani Yogurt, uh, Tanium, and Cake Bread Cellars. I'm pleased to be your moderator for this program, and today's speakers are affiliated with the Committee of Economic Development of the Conference Board. It's also known as CED. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan, business led public policy organization that delivers analysis and solutions to our nation's most critical issues. In the 75 years since its inception in 1942, CED has addressed national priorities that promote sustained economic growth and development aimed at benefiting all Americans. These activities have encompassed many examples of good policy, including the Marshall Plan in the late 1940s, education reform in the past three decades, and campaign finance reform in 2000. CED's research findings are coupled with multi-pronged outreach efforts throughout the country and abroad, achieving tangible impact at a local, state, and national level. With a new administration in Congress in office and an ever-changing world anxious about its future, we are about to have a high-level conversation on how to ensure business and policy leaders can generate prosperity for all and make capitalism sustainable for generations to come. I'm now pleased to give you a little bit more insights on our two speakers. Joseph Minarek is the Senior Vice President and Director of Research at the Committee for Economic Development and former Chief Economist for the Office of Management and Budget during the Clinton administration. Mr. Minarek is also the co-author of the book Sustaining Capitalism, Bipartisan Solutions to Restore Trust and Prosperity. And Lenny Mendoza, Director Emeritus of McKinsey & Company, is also a member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Direc Directors called the Board of Governors. Let me say a bit more about each. Joe was the Chief Economist of the Office of Management and Budget for all eight years of the Clinton administration. He helped formulate the administration's program to eliminate the budget deficit, including both the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993 and the Bipartisan Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Prior to his service in the Clinton administration, Joe worked closely with Senator Bill Bradley on his efforts to reform federal tax income taxes, which culminated in the Tax Reform Act in 1986. Recently, Joe served on the Bipartisan Policy Center's Debt Reduction Task Force. He holds a PhD in economics from Yale University. Lenny Mendoza, a director emeritus from the Washington DC and San Francisco offices of McKinsey and Company, which of course is a global management consulting firm. Lenny founded McKinsey's US state and local public sector practice for many years, Lenny led the firm's knowledge development efforts, overseeing the McKinsey Global Institute and the firm's communications, which includes the McKinsey Quarterly. Lenny is also the chair of Children Now, co-chair of California Forward, and co-founder and chair of Fuse Corps. He is the chair emeritus of the Bay Area Council and the Economic Institute of the Bay Area and was vice chair of the Stanford Graduate School of Business Advisory Council. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Board of Trustees for Junior Statesmanship of America, and the advisory board of the Public Policy Institute of California. Lenny holds an MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm tired just reading about both of you. <laughs> but please welcome Joseph Marinek and Lenny Mendoza for our conversation today. Thank you. So the book that I just mentioned in that intro, Sustaining Capitalism, Bipartisan Solutions to Restore Trust and Prosperity, 
actually lays out a clear plan for how business and policy leaders can generate prosperity for business and society now and make capitalism sustainable for generations to come. Making capitalism work for all Americans requires bold leadership beyond the policy community. It is America's business leaders who have needed experience on that front. And of course, they need to help course correct the economic system that we have today. In the past 20 years, many business leaders, though, have stayed on the sidelines. The book offers insights on how both business and policy leaders can play roles to enhance our American form of capitalism. So with that preamble, and I'd like all of you in the audience to be thinking about your questions for Joe and Lenny, because after I start out with a few questions myself, I want to turn to you and have you take the floor and ask questions of both of them. So I'm going to start with a question for you, Joe. Um, what about capitalism compelled CED to write this book, and why gear it to the business leaders? Well, Maggie, as you mentioned, uh, CED is 75 years old this year. And there was a very natural rhyme, if you will, between the state of capitalism 75 years ago with the US economy just out of the Great Depression because of the artificial stimulus of the effort for World War II. And now, when we are just out of our financial crisis, and the economy is pretty visibly continuing to suffer in some dimensions because of uh, the reaction to the financial crisis. Many Americans continue to believe that the US economy is not serving them well and that our economic system is not serving them well. And their reaction is a loss of trust. Business leaders have the ability, they have the skill set and CED's founders demonstrated the extent to which business leaders can contribute to the formulation of thinking about solving important public policy problems. Mm -hmm. So their concern about the Marshall Plan and the needs of society, which were not self-evident at that time with all of the hostilities at the end of World War II, but to convince the American people that there were decisions that could make a difference in making the US economy grow more strongly. So now we have the opportunity, we believe, to create the same kind of understanding if we can get business leaders to step out of the foxhole, to work as a group, and to contribute to a respectful public discussion about these important public issues. That's great. You know, a lot of times people think about capitalism and they, they think that you have to make a choice whether to be for or against it. Uh, so, Lenny, what makes the book bipartisan? Um, the book is bipartisan and, in fact, nonpartisan because of the way CED approaches all of its problems. CED is trustee led by a group of business executives who are participating in the group at, in their, the nation's interest rather than their business interest. They're trying to be business statespeople, modeling what the statespeople who were behind the Marshall Plan 75 years ago did, and they've always taken a balanced, practical view about what's in the interest of the economy and the interest of the nation, and therefore in the interest of business. It's their practical solutions that have been vetted through economists and a, a peer-reviewed process, and unfortunately, it's too rare these days. Um, we really think it's a, a, a model of what Americans really expect is happening in Washington, um, and, and an opportunity for business and government and civic leaders to come together and come to solutions that, when presented, um, have widespread support and would be in the interest of the country. That's great. So I'm going to go through some key highlights of the book from a chapter perspective and, and do a little deeper dive on those. So Lenny, let's talk about the book's chapter on health care reform. It's a big topic now uh, in, in all American households. The top priority of the new Congress and president has talked about health care reform. So what does the business community want from health care reform 2.0? What's important to business? Okay, let, let me start with um, when I think about what business wants, I think of business broadly, not mm -hmm. participants in the health care system. So I'm not talking about what 
hospitals or insurers or pharmaceutical companies. We're talking about people who are business leaders who employ people and are, are thinking about what's in their business and employees' interests. And I think as CED outlined in this book and its, and its very active engagement in this topic, that the guiding principles for any healthcare reform in the United States needs to be three. It's accessible to every American, that it's high quality, and that it's affordable. Those sound really simple, but they're very hard to do. And that means first and foremost that we need to ensure that there is competition in the marketplace at all levels so that the system can work to enable those things. But in healthcare, that's really hard because of some structural shortfalls that make that hard and drive up costs. So a lot of what CED has been advocating, and I think it, what is widely accepted by the business community, is that we do need to retain some elements of the Affordable Care Act that are particularly important and popular, like the ability to stay on your parents' health care plan until you're 26, that there's no denial for pre-existing conditions, and that there's no lifetime cap on what is covered. But we do think that it's important that there is more competition in the system less fee-for-service medic medicine, and a limited role, but important role that government can play in helping ensuring that that happens. Now, do you, uh, Lenny, just a quick follow-up on that. Do you, uh, when I think about business in general, and I think about business providing workers with health care, how active do you think the business community should be on this topic? You know, um, CED was one of the leading business voices in the debate around the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. and help bring an employer voice to the occasion, to the equation. Right. And I think it's really, really important if healthcare is determined by the participants in the healthcare system as opposed to by business more broadly, you're gonna get a different answer. And so it's really important that business was engaged then, it's really important that business is engaged now. Exactly. So Joe, the book details a plan that covers all yet keeps costs down and increases innovation. That, that almost sounds like it's impossible to do. C can you tell us a bit about the proposal? The most important thing, I think Lenny mentioned the magic word, it's competition. If you think about how the US economy works, sector by sector, mm -hmm. we make enormous progress in terms of providing people with better products at lower cost. Healthcare has been the exception to that, and a large part of the reason why has been that we do not have real competition in the healthcare marketplace. Many people, most people, get coverage through their employers. Mm -hmm. Their employers have a hard time giving people choices. The important thing about competition around the economy is that people can choose the suppliers who give them what they want at a price that they're willing to pay. That doesn't happen in healthcare. So what we want to do is to have cost conscious competition based on choice among consumers. And the way we would do that is to provide individuals with refundable credits that they can use to buy the insurance plans that they want. Competition among healthcare providers uh, on the basis of individuals trying to be their own doctors and choosing individual providers and telling them what services to provide is very often not going to work. People are not physicians. They go to physicians because they have special training and they can do that. If we have competition where individuals can choose plans and the plans have to deliver value and quality to the individuals, then the plans will impose discipline on the providers to provide care on a basis that is affordable and that provides services that people want. It all really flows from that basic uh, delivery of competition and choice among empowered consumers uh, to choose among plans to provide the care that they want in a way they want. So as you think about the, the bill that was just passed by the House, Joe, and you think about the proposal that you put in the book, are there parallels to that? Are you seeing the, the new proposal move toward some of the ideas that you've talked about? There are similarities in that the plan that was passed in the House would provide credits to individuals to buy plans. 
One difference is that it's not clear that the credits are going to be sufficient for individuals to be able to afford plans. Mm -hmm. And it's important, in our, an important aspect of our plan is that the amounts of the credits would be determined by the prices of affordable plans in market areas around the country so that more expensive areas would have higher credits, less expensive areas would have lower credits. One area where there is some divergence mm -hmm. between what the House did and what we recommend is that we would provide risk-adjusted costs uh, uh, pricing of insurance plans so everyone pays the same price. And then the amounts of reimbursements to plans differ according to whether those plans have uh, customers who are more or less healthy. So those who do a good job of taking care of people with serious ailments are compensated by receiving more premium revenue. Those who for one reason or other get uh, customers who are healthier would get less. That would help to reduce the incentive of health insurance plans of trying to find ways to select their customers rather than trying to find ways to deliver high quality affordable care. Do you think um, the Senate would bring up that type of a proposal or is there any champions for that on the Senate side as they, they look to uh, conference with the House? I had a very interesting day of conversations with uh, representatives of the two parties uh, from in the staffs uh, on one of the committees that has jurisdiction in the Senate. And the conversation that we had, we presented uh, our ideas before the uh, members of the Democratic staff. The answer that we got was, you know, this is actually really good, but the Republicans will never sign on. Then in the afternoon, we went to see the Republican staff. And the answer that we got is, this really is a good plan, but the Democrats will never sign on. <laughs> we, we need to have a serious conversation. One of the things Well, can't that, you just get them all in the room and have one conversation? <laughs> uh, that's one of the things that's very, very difficult to do. Yeah. Um, we need to have, I think, a national conversation. And one of the things we have to recognize is we will all collectively pay for precisely 100% of the cost of delivering health care to all Americans. Yep. Once we recognize that, we can have an adult conversation and we can come up with a plan where we pay those costs in a fashion that looks like it was done on purpose. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to get to. <laughs> okay, so let's turn to another focus of the book, um, one that's front and center in Washington, which is tax and regulatory reform. It is also near and dear to the hearts of businesses around our country. So Lenny, to get U.S. businesses firing on all cylinders, what needs to happen on tax and regulatory reform? So I will um, give you a very brief answer to that in the interest of time, and, and then if we want to get into it in more detail, Joe's done so much work on this, both at CED and before, that I'd rather let him have the time than me try and explain it in more detail. Okay. But I think it's fundamentally two things. Um, we do need regulatory reform. That doesn't mean less regulation or more regulation. What it means is regulation that works. Right. Um, our regulations are too often put in place without clear objectives and left there as the world changes. And so what we really need is more principled-based regulation that's clear on what the goals are that are defined, measurable, and reported so that we know what's working and adapt them as we go as opposed to putting in something that we never look at again. And on tax reform, and particularly on corporate tax reform, which is a big component of what the market has been expecting that is going to come through this Congress, um, we do think there is an important, and I do think there's an important opportunity for corporate tax reform, which largely has to do with simplifying and eliminating some of the preferences for different types of corporate tax um, activity that goes on that creates a very unlevel playing field. Doing that, which can help raise the opportunity to raise revenues for the opportunity to lower the statutory tax rates. So it's basically a simplification of the, the tax code so that people are competing rather than competing for tax preferences. 
So Joe, you want to elaborate since you have a lot of experience in this area? I think Lenny has really touched the important points, but I just want to emphasize really one with respect to regulation, and I'll speak a little bit more broadly about taxation. With respect to regulation, there has been a lot of progress made around the world in recent years in reviewing regulations ex post. Do they continue to make sense? Do they continue to achieve their objectives? If not, how can we fix them and make them work better? Experts will tell you that the United States has somehow fallen behind the curve in that kind of ex post examination. There is, as Lenny alluded to, there, there's an assumption that if you're spending more money on regulation, you're regulating more, you're regulating more heavily. One of the important aspects of this need for ex post review is you need data to be able to judge whether the regulations continue to function. And one of our, the problems that we've had is that regulators don't have the information they need to perform that ex post review. Data costs money. So we need to recognize that sometimes you have to pay more to get better government. And if you don't have the information, you're regulating in the dark. Um, also appreciate Lenny's comments on the way that tax reform works. If you turn the clock back to the early 1980s, uh, the United States was in a very analogous position to where we are right now, which is to say we had a comparatively high corporate tax rate, and there was a lot of concern about income that was escaping the process of taxation. At the end of the 1986 tax reform, the United States had one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the world, but it had a much more watertight tax base, and more income was taxed. As a result of that, the United States was more competitive around the world in terms of attracting people and attracting businesses to operate in the United States. You wanted to earn your profit in a country that had a comparatively low rate. Uh, other countries have competed with us since then. In many instances, the competition has been, uh, let's say, asymmetrical. You have countries that are very happy to live within the security perimeter that's provided by the United States, uh, but they offer cut rate corporate tax uh, rates for uh, firms that are willing to recognize their profits in other countries' boundaries. And in some instances, it's the recognition of income, not the actual earning of income. That's what, what matters. We cannot necessarily compete point for point uh, with countries that are willing to uh, try to poach on our tax base in that, in that fashion. But what we can do, we're the biggest market in the world, there are lots of reasons for businesses to want to be here so that they are close to their customers. If we have a competitive corporate tax rate, we will get more than our fair share of the business activity around the world. And that's what we ought to be aiming for in the fashion. that. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I think from a business perspective today, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. And it makes it very difficult for us to compete, exactly. no doubt. So I have a couple questions here from, from the audience that I thought I would uh, pose to either one of you. Um, if Congress was on the same health care plans as the American public, would that help get the health care issue resolved? Ironically, um, before the latest rounds of legislation, the Congress had a health care plan that was actually uh, extremely attractive in terms of its, uh, its uh, attributes. It was the same health care plan that all federal employees have. As a retired federal employee, I'm under that plan. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it gives you a choice of alternative insurance plans. It gives you a fixed dollar contribution. You choose among those plans. If you choose a less expensive plan, you pay less. If you want a more expensive plan, you can, you can get it, 
but you are responsible for the extra cost. And as a result, many government employees choose relatively efficient plans that deliver care uh, in a, in a cost-effective way, uh, and they get to save money for doing it. Uh, that is the kind of plan that works in a number of locations around the country. CalPERS follows that model. Mm. Uh, several uh, firms here in California do as well. Stanford University has an excellent system where uh, employees of the university are cost responsible and are in, have an incentive to choose effective plans. So that really wasn't the problem. And uh, we'd like to have much of the country go on to that kind of a system. That would deliver, uh, would, would create incentives for efficient, uh, efficient care. So I'll give a slight um, more pointed view of that, which sure. is if more of America was on the type of plan that Congress has, would be better off rather than the other way around. Yep. So you know, that, those principles are what are very attractive in the kind of system we're talking about. Absolutely. Do you think um, a single-payer health system is pro or anti-capitalistic? Personally, I am not a big fan of single-payer single payer as a system. Of course, the word payer can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Um, I would not like to see the U.S. government get into the business of delivering health care mm -hmm. for the same reason that I would not like to see the U.S. government get into the business of delivering most goods and services. Right. Uh, the problem with having a single deliverer of a good or a service is that without competition, atrophy, uh, sclerosis sets in. Uh, you need competition to reveal better ways of doing things. And having a single provider of health care, if that's what's meant by single payer, it seems to me would be inimical to that benefit of competition. There are lots of nonprofit, uh, well-motivated health care delivery systems around the country and here in California. And potentially they can do a very good job, but they also know from looking at their competition and the plans that individuals choose instead of them, that they have a constant need to try to keep their game up and competitive and to be doing things in the most efficient way. So uh, Lenny, another area that's causing a lot of anxiety for many businesses is the topic of trade. Um, how do we achieve trade policies that really strike that right balance between engaging foreign markets and looking out for U.S. jobs? Sure. So um, in today's politicized environment, trade has uh, unfortunately become a major portion of the boogeyman for the challenges of U.S. citizens' view about their economic fortunes. The actual facts are unequivocally that trade is incredibly net beneficial to the United States. And as importantly, from a global perspective, it's lifted billions of people out of abject poverty. It is not a zero-sum game. Most corporations at any scale in the United States have integrated global supply chains that take advantage of that opportunity, and it's helped enable lower-cost goods and higher-value products to Americans. The challenge with trade is not to go backwards. The challenge is why all of what I just said is true. There are particular portions of the, the U.S. population by geography and by nature of what their, their jobs have been or where they, what they have been doing, their education background, that are hurt by trade. And what we need to do is ensure that there are, pack, there are paths so that those individuals have opportunities to benefit from the huge advantages to trade that happen to the rest of the country and not feel like they're, they're, that's great for everyone else, but it's bad for me. So we really, business has an enormous interest in ensuring that we do not close the borders, that we, whether that's through trade or through, through immigration, that we do not start an extremely dangerous tariff war, and that we do think creatively about how we ensure that that prosperity is shared widely and not uh, narrowly. So just as a follow-up, I have read that um, our top 15 trade country partners 
carry charges to us for imports between 17 and 22 percent. So why is it wrong to level that playing field with foreign imports? Why is that wrong? Do you, you want well, to it, it isn't. Uh, but one of the, this is a transition that we have to make, and to say transition, we're talking about a very long period of time, but go back to the end of World War II. There was an understanding on the part of our policymakers at that time that the United States as by far the most prosperous country, uh, as the country that went through the war essentially unscathed, uh, really had to be conscious of the needs of other parts of the world uh, to have some advantage in the terms of trade so that they could develop and become more prosperous mm -hmm. with the goal that at the end of the day, we could trade on a more even basis, they would be more prosperous, they would be better customers for us, they would be better suppliers for us, and we could pursue our own different competitive advantages and have a more prosperous and a more peaceful world. Well, we're getting a lot closer to that ideal and part of the difficulty of the current U.S. trade environment is trying to find the way to have those relative advantages of other countries erode to the point where the playing field becomes more level. And that's something that we have to achieve over a period of time. We have some trading partners uh, who uh, want to be dealt with, uh, want to have the standards of living to which they have become accustomed to uh, uh, borrow the language from uh, divorce uh, proceedings. We don't want to divorce. Lenny's exactly right. If we do not compete with the rest of the world, we, we are in an environment where technological opportunities are going to be pursued. If they're not pursued here, they'll be pursued somewhere else. As someone who believes that the United States has something to contribute to standards of behavior around the world as a leader, I worry about what this world will be like if we cede our leadership standing by giving up what we gain by competing with the rest of the world and taking advantage of those new technological opportunities. Think about the United States as falling behind the technological frontier and what that implies for national security considerations. We need to continue to expose ourselves to competition. We need to compete in trade and we need to win to maintain our standards and to help to create good standards of behavior around the world in a whole range of different dimensions. Can I say one more thing on that? Sure. I 100% um, agree with what Joe said and another component of what is necessary to gain the political support for that is that we really do need to think about a different kind of adjustment assistance for workers that are displaced. Right. We have a very narrow definition of those that is based on a, a, a 20 or 30 year old definition of who is hurt by trade. The real problem isn't just trade adjustment assistance, it's about people losing their jobs and their, their income because of what's happening with the intersection of trade and technology. And what we really need to do is move to something that's a much broader wage insurance program to compensate people for the challenge of losing their jobs and then really help, really not talk about it, do it with training and job search assistance so Absolutely. that those are displaced. Absolutely correct and extremely important. Yeah, and, and the other piece of this, this whole equation is if you can have a more balanced trade environment with other countries that are now successful, it used to be fledgling, you will create more jobs in the United States by having people produce products and manufacture products at home yep. that will give a number of people that are displaced the opportunity for different employment. Yep. Yeah, I, I do want to share one anecdote which is to say that different nations' perceptions of trade relationships are very subjective. Uh, during my time in the White House, I once found myself sitting in a small group discussion next to the Prime Minister of Australia. And he was asked about the trade relationship between the United States and Australia. And his answer was, the United States is the most open trading nation in the world. 
except in products where Australia sells to the United States. <laughs> I had a conversation in Italy uh, with some, some just random citizens, but, but business leaders and very intelligent people. They told me exactly the same thing with respect to the United States and Italy, using almost exactly the same words. So negotiation over questions like this is where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, and it's, it's not going to be the easiest thing in the world, but we're going to have to be open to having those discussions. Yes. So for our radio audience, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California program, and we are discussing how to ensure business and policy leaders can generate prosperity and make capitalism sustainable for generations to come. Our guests are Joseph Menarek, who's the Senior Vice President and Director of Research for the Committee for Economic Development, and former chief economist for the Office of Management and Budget during the Clinton administration, and Lenny Mendoza, the Director Emeritus of McKinsey and & Company. And I'm Maggie Wilderotter, your moderator, and you can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, catch up with program videos on the club's YouTube channel, and find the club on Twitter and Facebook. So I'm gonna go back to the audience with, uh, with some questions. This is an interesting one. Um, what is the only thing you wish people like Bernie Sanders knew about capitalism? Joe, what do you think about that? Wish I could talk to him sometimes. <laughs> um, I, one thing that I find very painful is when people paint with too broad a brush. Uh, the financial crisis, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling the family secret here. Uh, there were business people who played a role in the problems that we had in the financial crisis. They were a very small minority of all businessmen. And as a result of the pain that has been felt in the financial crisis, many other business people have been tarred as a result. The acronym CEO has become an epithet. I don't think many people understand the extent to which CEOs in, again, to generalize, non-financial corporations were incredibly hurt by the consequences of the financial crisis, where credit lines were cut off for businesses that had to scramble to continue to exist, to provide jobs for the people who worked for them, and yet, Again, the notion of business people and CEOs has become uh, virtually an epithet that these are the pariahs of, of U.S. society. I think we have to be far more discriminating in thinking about the people who provide jobs, care about their workers, try to get them health care, try to get them uh, solid prospects for retirement, uh, and we're not part of the problems that we have had over the last decade. If we, we open our eyes and look in a more careful and discriminating way, I think that could be one of the first steps towards creating a national conversation where we address some of these very important problems. So uh, another question from the audience on the whole trade topic is, uh, in, is dropping out of TPP a good policy decision for the United States? Uh, TPP was not perfect. Right. Uh, there were, and, and one of the most painful things, I think, to people who are favorable towards the importance of trade, as, as Lenny and I are, uh, was hearing about some of the very specific industry uh, specific provisions that were provided in the agreement uh, that provided advantages to particular people and particular lines of business. That having been said, uh, in general, the TPP helped to bring down the barriers for trade, uh, would have helped U.S. businesses to expand markets overseas, and we can't allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. And we need to pursue such opportunities where we have uh, the chance to do so. Can I add two things to that because about what would a revised version of a global trade agreement look like? What right. needs to be in it that's not in it? 
that the TPP. One would be a specific way to deal with the concern that Joe raised, which is much more transparency about what's actually in it. Mm -hmm. um, being able to negotiate relatively discreetly is fine, but there needs to be enough time and transparency so that Congress knows what they're voting on and has an opportunity for citizens to see that before they, they get bits and pieces of it and feel angst about what feel like special favors. The second thing is, related to what we were talking about a while ago, we, we need to go beyond hand-waving about adjustment assistance. Yep. If you want to bring, the, if you're going to have a bipartisan solution to trade, which is going to need to be if it's going to sustain, you have to address that issue, otherwise you're going to lose the entire Democratic Party. So Lenny, uh, I'm going to combine three different questions from the audience because they all have a similar theme. You know, as technology continues to eliminate jobs due to productivity improvements, um, will there be a need to supply income support directly to individuals in the country on an ongoing basis? Uh, will technology continue to eliminate more jobs in the country? And how about automation? Does, is that an enabler of sustaining capitalism? So when you think about that theme of technology, no, yes, and yes. Okay. So um, technology is going to continue to advance. Um, you know, I'm not saying anything that will be unsurprising in this part of the world about our views on that. The opportunity to apply technology to portions of the economy that need more productivity and innovation, like healthcare, for cost improvement, not just for um, advances in, in, in uh, pharmaceuticals in education and skills retraining, in the public sector more generally, they all need a burst of innovation and productivity improvement. And technology is gonna be a big part of that. The near-term impact on some of that has and will always be some job displacement. Um, it will also create new innovations, new products, less expensive ways to do things that will create jobs. So the challenge with it is how do we take advantage of all of the things that technology can bring, but ensure, like in the trade conversation, that those who are disadvantaged by it are, are both have new opportunities and new skill support to take advantage of it, and if they are not able to, are have the resources provided to them so that they're not um, really, really poor and, and bad off as a result of that. I don't believe the end answer to that, which a lot of, uh, conversations happening in this part of the world that we need some sort of universal basic income or something that when we're no, no one's ever working that we give everyone an out, a uh, chunk of money to be happy. I think that's a terrible answer. I think what we need is to work on the challenges that I described, make our social safety network, make the education system and retraining work, and make sure that we are continuing to innovate and cre create opportunities which is in the private sector, which is where jobs come from. So when you think about um, the shortfalls of the education system. So you've mentioned education, it's really important. Um, what role can business leaders play in strengthening what's happening in education today? So um, CED has had a long history of engagement in education. And the two particular areas where CED has spent a lot of time and there's widespread business agreement around are the need to invest in high quality early education so that we ensure that everyone enters the K-12 system prepared and particularly in a country with as much diversity of background, language differences, uh, challenges of economic upbringing that puts people behind, that will help level the playing field so mm -hmm. people enter at a point where they can take advantage of our, our public education system. So CED has been one of the most vocal business voices for investing in high quality early education. We obviously need to have our K-12 system deliver against its promise. The other area that CED has been deeply involved in where business leaders are acutely aware of the challenge is post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. um, in today's economy, most of the jobs that are being created and in the future will be even more so are we gonna, going to require some sort of post-secondary education. And what we really need is reforms and activity that encourage our higher education system to really deliver against the kinds of skills that are needed for the jobs of the future. We really need to have 
college graduates feel that they have the skills that are technical skills as well as social, emotional, and communication skills to compete. And we need to have hold our higher education system, our workforce development system, accountable for delivering those. We should be encouraging and investing in higher education to deliver those results, not deliver seat, butts in seats in higher education institutions. Mm -hmm. So sticking to the education theme, Joe, in the book, you devote a whole chapter to economic inequality and opportunity. So can education reform really narrow that gap and boost opportunity for Americans? Yeah, we believe it can. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the grapefruit that Lenny just sliced and slice it across a different axis to look at it in a different way, uh, noting that every time I slice a grapefruit, I always get grapefruit juice all over my glasses. Uh, but there, let, let me cut this into two pieces. One is the education that we deliver in the conventional educational system. And the other is what we're observing now, which is a need for people to to upskill and to renew their skills as they go through their work lives. There have been surveys of educators and employers asking the question, are today's graduates well suited for today's jobs? And the results have always leaned in the direction where the educators say, yes, our students are well prepared, and the employers say, no, they're not. Uh, we need to have that conversation, and I think one thing that business leaders can do is to engage in that conversation and to try to express to educators uh, what it is that they believe they need in their graduates so that they can perform better. Uh, and obviously, if students come to the job and employers are more satisfied with what they bring to the job, we're going to have better performance all along the line, and that's going to help to contribute not only to reducing inequality, but also to improving the status of the entire society because we're going to have a more productive workforce. With respect to the ongoing career development of individuals, uh, one problem that we have is that oftentimes employers do not communicate as well as they should what it is that they need, what kinds of skills are they looking for. Uh, oftentimes, employers from across the street look at, uh, for example, community colleges. And here in California, you have one of the most successful community college systems. It's actually the largest college system in the world. So. Exactly. And Oftentimes, from across the street, the employers will criticize the uh, educational institutions and say they're not getting to me what it is that I need. Again, better communication. And in particular, I think on the part of employers, more of an openness to people who are learning new skills and developing their careers from the bottom rather than necessarily going out to elite institutions and picking people from the top of the tree, could be very productive. And even working directly with educational institutions in terms of developing curricula that work uh, could be extremely helpful. It's not that the employers have to become educators, but it is that they work with educators to generate the skills in the part of individuals on the part of individuals who are looking to advance their careers. You know, at, at Frontier, when I was there, we served uh, rural America predominantly. And we had 35,000 communities in the United States. And we needed technical capabilities from students. And a lot of uh, our workers were high school graduates. So at the community colleges around the country, we would put labs in those community colleges with our technology and our technicians would volunteer and teach classes. And, and what we would do is, is create a feeder system for new employees to come and work at the company where people didn't have to move out of their smaller towns in order to find good jobs. And I think a lot of businesses are doing that on a one-off basis. There's no sort of a 
collective effort on the part of business. And Lenny, as you think about this as a, a great business leader and a consultant to businesses for many years, is there a way to get better collective wisdom for education that we're missing out on? Sure. Um, so I think our education system is the answer to the, a lot of the challenges that, that we talk about in terms of the, the, the effects of a rapidly changing in a globally integrated and technologically advancing world. But our, we need a scale of innovation and pace of change in our education system that matches all the rest of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, one of the more interesting examples that I, I have heard recently was uh, the United States was one of the first countries that had universal K-12 to as part of its, uh, its um, natural, national view about what we needed. And it was in part because we needed to train a bunch of people to be available to move from agriculture to the industrial age. We're now in an era where we need everyone to be able to have post-secondary education skills to compete. But we assume that the answer to that is it's all got to be before you're 22 or 26. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's up to you to do whatever you want. It actually turns out that companies pay as much in training as our entire higher education system every year. So if we thought about it as the way Singapore is now doing, for example, which is you get a lifelong credit for two years to do post high school education that you use when you need, as opposed to saying you all do it in the beginning and then it's up to you after that. That to me is kind of interesting to say, why don't we have another way to think about it's not one time, it's lifelong learning that we have to do and think about how do we make sure that that learning is relevant for employers. And if we did that and had employers investing more in, in education, had more corporate, I mean, uh, public investment in higher education, it's not just early on, that might be something interesting to, to consider. Yeah, because it also plays into the fact that people are living longer, too. Right. And they're working longer. If you look at the baby boomer generation, there are many boomers now that are not retiring. They're in their 70s and even into their 80s still working and still viable in the workforce. And I think having the ability to repot and go back and learn new skills is critical to, uh, to being able to sustain a living yep. as, as we get older. So again, on uh, questions from the audience, uh, the threat to economic opportunity has to do with our national debt. If you think about the debt today, Lenny, maybe you could start with uh, any plan on debt reduction that the business community can maybe rally behind. And, um, and Joe, maybe you can talk about it based upon what you're seeing in Washington and the, and the puts and takes. Sure, I, I'll go first because gonna, you're going to answer it. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, my, my answer is put Joe Minerick in charge because the last time he was in the White House, we actually had a surplus. Right. And as shocking as that may seem, this is not impossible to do <laughs> if you have thoughtfulness about how you go about it and a bipartisan view about how you make it happen. So I really, I'm going to punt that to Joe. Cause yeah, he, I think he's the last living person on earth that knows how to balance a budget. So <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people that the last three years of my job, the, the, what I had to spend my time on was figuring out how to show in the budget uh, the money that we were using to buy back securities in the open market because we had cash, we didn't need to borrow money. Uh, and, Novel concept. Uh, that was fun. That was a real challenge and it was one of the most enjoyable things I had to do. Um, one of the things, there, there is of course an argument that goes back and forth. Uh, these days between people who say we should raise taxes and people who say we should cut spending. Uh, we have resolved that argument. We have allowed this problem to get so serious that the only viable answer is both. Mm -hmm. uh, the long-term U.S. budget problem is health care. Uh, that is staring you in the face. I know many people who don't want to look at it, but it is the reality. The co rising cost of Medicare, which is driven by the retirement of the baby boomers, but also the increasing lifespans that people live and reduced 
family sizes on average, so we have fewer children growing into workers to pay for our current retirees. And in addition, among our retiree population, which is growing, it is becoming top heavy, relatively speaking, with respect to age. And the cost of delivering health care for older old people grow very rapidly relative to younger old people. So the health care problem is really, it's, it's uh, demography cubed mm -hmm. is, is really the driver of the problem, plus the fact that delivering health care to a person of the same age over time is growing faster than our economy is. And we have to find solutions there. But what I think many people have to appreciate the U.S. healthcare system right now is pressing 18% of the U.S. GDP. And what that means is that the size of the U.S. healthcare industry is approximately equal to the size of the economy of France. To give you a sense of the scale of what we're talking about, this is a massive ocean liner. And it is very hard to turn around because a lot of what we put into our healthcare system really amounts to long-term costs. We build buildings, we buy very expensive diagnostic machines, we train heart surgeons. Uh, a heart surgeon, we think of labor as economists, we think of labor as a variable cost. You train a heart surgeon and you've got a heart surgeon for 30 years. Even the labor in the healthcare system is, in effect, a fixed long-term cost. And we have elderly people today who have medical conditions and are in long-term treatment programs with physicians they trust. If we want to change the workings of our healthcare system to become more efficient, we have to respect those relationships of the current elderly, and even people who are looking at retirement in the relatively near future. So it is going to be very hard to save money out of our healthcare system, even though it is the root of our budget problem, it's gonna be very hard to save money quickly. So if we recognize that we have a debt that is growing faster than our economy is, think about what if your mortgage debt was growing faster than your income. That's where we are as a nation. It is going to be very hard to achieve short-term savings in the cost driver of health care. So we've got to find some way to cut off this growth of debt before it gets out of control, mm -hmm. before it's more than we can afford to service it. Uh, and you can't go to the actual cause of the problem in the near term because it's going to be very hard to change. Who are you going to call? <laughs> It's not going to be Ghostbusters. You've got to go somewhere else in the healthcare system. Social Security isn't it because we have retirees and we can't cut the benefits of the 82 year old widow in the cold water flat and tell her, you know, I'm sorry, we've got to cut your Social Security benefits. Go out and find a job. She can't. The 69 year old man who moved pianos can't go out and find a job. Uh, we have to find another way to reduce uh, the ongoing growth of debt, which is not sustainable. And the way we can do that in the short term, we can go to other programs in the budget which are small and which have already been cut, defense spending, spending on infrastructure, spending on education, or we can raise taxes. We're going to have to find a way to take all of those elements, recognizing all of that inertia behind health care, all of that inertia behind Social Security, and find ways to reduce this ongoing growth of debt, which is already uh, beyond what this economy can sustain. Yeah. It's going to be very painful. Yeah, and there's, there's uh, some other upsides in terms of you know, the stimulation of the economy for businesses to do better, to produce more which also pays more in taxes, you know, in, in America. And then I also think the, you know, changes to the FDA programs and how you get drugs approved in this country to reduce the regulatory burden um, and to be able to actually treat patients that aren't just stage four from a cancer perspective, as an example, to be able to 
treat patients in zero and one cancers with some of the new innovations that are coming out and, and making those available, because I know another, a number of countries actually do that. There, there were a couple of questions just quickly um, on healthcare. Are, are there any countries that actually do this right that could be a model for us? I mean, uh, uh, one question mentioned the UK or Canada, or what do you think? The best model I think that we could follow is actually the Netherlands where they give individuals a credit and tell them to go and buy a good healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the actual healthcare delivery institutions in the Netherlands are not uh, the kind of institutions that we have in the United States. You're having competition among plans that are more fee-for-service plans than creating integrated systems that can be more efficient. However, uh, because of the way they have organized their reimbursement system, uh, many of the delivery mechanisms in their country have found ways to do, uh, to do, do the job better. Uh, an interesting phenomenon uh, in terms of the people's awareness of what healthcare costs are. Uh, when the Netherlands went from an employer-based system where the employer paid a part of the premium and the individual topped that up. And they went to a credit system and gave individuals credit, uh, credits and gave them all of the power to go out and search for plans. The initial reaction of the population was that the cost of healthcare had gone way up. And the reason why they thought that was because they all had not had any consciousness of all the money that the employers were paying. Mm -hmm. They thought that the total cost of the insurance plan was their share, which was only a small portion of the cost of the insurance plans. So another part of what's going on here is we have no idea. Many Americans have no clue what it costs to get an insurance plan because they're not paying it. Right. And that lack of awareness, I think, is part of the difficulty that we have to face. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're running out of time, so we've reached a point in the program where there's probably time for one last question. And I thought I would, uh, this is a, an audience question as well. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned this. There was a new executive order yesterday on cybersecurity, which is a big topic, of course, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, protection, detection, and recovery are critical in this connected world that we live in. Um, how big? of a threat is cybersecurity to economic growth and sustained capitalism? Uh, I, potentially, it's enormous. Um, I happen to have a son-in-law who works in this field, uh, and uh, he's working on a PhD at this time, and uh, the, his field is what is known as kinetic cybersecurity, and he has uncovered episodes around the world. Uh, there was one uh, instance in Northern Europe where somebody hacked into a public transportation system, turned a trolley network into his private train set, and had the trains going around and was, there it is, at his uh, keyboard. Now in that case, it was recreation. Imagine what we could face if somebody were so motivated and had the same skills and was trying to bring down an economy. Um, I'm not the world's foremost authority on this. My son-in-law is a lot closer to that. Uh, but uh, from what I've heard from him, I am much more concerned about the problems of cybersecurity in the future of our economy. And Lenny, maybe a couple comments from you. And also, uh, on the corporate governance side for businesses, what can they do about this, right? So it, it is a, an, a, an enormous risk. Um, not just for the public sector, but for, for, for companies right. about the implications of cyber attacks on their own activity, whether it's data release or something more malicious, not that data release isn't malicious in and of itself, right. but it is an area where um, you're seeing increasing attention, as you know, at the board level of companies about why this is so important. When they're doing the risk assessments, this comes up as one that's at the top of the list that you need to pay attention to. I would say it's also one of those areas where there may be an opportunity for a tighter, productive working relationship between Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the technology that's 
um, going to be necessary in part to solve this will be built here. And you have a different conversation where you're sitting around the table trying to solve the same problem. Um, if we can encourage more statesmanlike reaction and involvement from Silicon Valley in an issue like that, it may create opportunities to be more broadly engaged productively in, in the interest of the country. Yeah, I also think that there's an opportunity for uh, younger people who do want to do well and do good to maybe provide services, even on internships or sabbaticals, to the U.S. government. Absolutely. Because the prices of uh, jobs in the Silicon Valley, they're paid very well, and the government can't match those salaries. But it's a, it's a big um, issue for our federal government today is we don't have the talent, and we don't have a pool of that talent coming to the government. So that is, I think, another public-private partnership opportunity that we have. So again, I would like to uh, thank both of our panelists, uh, Joseph Merrick. I think you know one of the things that you've done, I think for all of us with this book, is opened up the opportunities for businesses to get more active and to be more involved. So thank you for that. And again, he is the co-author of Sustaining Capitalism, Bipartisan Solutions to Restore Trust and Prosperity. And of course, Lenny Mendoza, our Director Emeritus of McKinsey and Company. I'd also like to thank our audiences here and on the radio, television, and the internet. Uh, a reminder that copies of Joe's book are on sale, and he'll be pleased to sign them in this room following the program. I'm Maggie Wilderotter, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you.